love eccentric stuff, you know, and just the idea that someone It's dated in a really good way, I think, you know, it's dated in a kind of vintage way. That's what number two used to say. I think a, a kid watching it today would would probably get an, an insight into late 1960s surrealism. And would, would probably be, be fascinated by, by kind of, you know, what, what is it all about? What is all the commotion about? Why, you know, what, why is it so interesting that they find out why this man jacks in his job? Subject shows great enthusiasm for his work. He is utterly devoted and loyal. Is this a man that suddenly walks out? And I didn't walk out. I resigned. People change, exactly. I think when they made the show back in the 60s, they've obviously had a carte blanche to do what, exactly what they like. So you've got um, all these ideas, you've got references to, to literature, you've got drug references. They're obviously having a great time making it. <laughs> Just remember, no over-excitement, please. Hmm? That part of me that makes me, um, makes me want to be an actor and uh, an English actor at that who, who likes putting on gowns and swaggering as a, um, you know, prosecuting counsel and things like that, of course, also wanted to be number two because that's the grand guignol part. That's the part that the wonderfully textured, um, fruity-voiced English actors play. Ah, uh, excellent number 12, of course. The Laughing Prisoner, which, uh, which was done um, as, as part of the tube, came about because Jules Holland, uh, he was, you know, taken off. He was just not allowed to be on television, just for saying, just for saying the word. I mean, the F word. And uh, he, uh, so th they had this idea, Jeff Wanfer, who was the director of, uh, of the tube, and Malcolm Gary, who was the producer, that um, when he came back, we should pretend that actually he'd been sent by Channel 4 to, to, to the village. Q, number seven. Yes, you, number seven, up here. Oh, I'm not a number. I'm a television personality. <laughs> we shot a tube special in Port Marion, where the, the village is, as you know. And, uh, and I played the, the number two who had been keeping him prisoner, trying to find out why he'd said this word. I am number two, and this is the village. Get to know it well, number seven. From now on, it's your home. It's your home until you give us certain information that we require from you. Well, I'm perfect. I have to tell you anything you would like to know. What would you like to know? Don't play games with me, number seven. I'm not very good at them. By hook or by crook, by fair means or foul, we will find out why you resign. Well, it's perfectly simple. For a long I begin time, to be... weary of your impertinent tricks, number seven. When I first saw it, I'd just come out of prison. <laughs> amusingly and I thought it was about people inside a prison so I thought oh, I'll watch this and uh, you know just that transporting moment of watching the the first title sequence and the uh, and the Lotus and uh, and I was there I was absolutely there <laughs> Go figure, as they say, across the water. Everything is becoming more clear. I may have found a way out. Is that just what they want me to think? One of the most controversial episodes, Living in Harmony, was co-written by Ian Rakoff. What was it like working with Patrick? Well, it, it was like I was given the freedom to try and portray my interpretation, and then finally it all comes out in brainwashing. You know, that's what it was all about. Sex! 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 You don't have to be in entertainment just for entertainment. You can display a certain social conscience, a certain moral concern, and this is what I think motivated Pat McGowan. And this is part of the strength of the series, was that this man was driven to reflect upon the nature of society as we were all falling victim to then and still are now.
how relevant do you think the show is today? I don't see why it couldn't have an even greater impact upon many people than it did before, because our lives have progressively become more frustrating. The telephone is a nightmare when you have an emergency situation and you need to speak to somebody, you get a machine. And then you've got to press a button and you get another machine. And if you speak to a human voice, you are extremely fortunate. I will immobilize all electronic controls. Listen to me. You are free to go. You are free to go. Free to go. Free to go. Starring alongside Patrick in Living in Harmony and the final episode, Fallout, was Alexis Canner. Doing The Prisoner had an effect on me in the way that one is affected by working with a big talent. Uh, Peter Brook changed my life when I, when I worked for him and working for McGowan probably changed my life. All these are influences uh, that we have on each other and, and, and they're lasting. Oh, Dad, I'm your baby, Dad. Yo, oh, your baby something, Daddy? Confess! The bones is yours, Dad! They came from you, my Daddy. Patrick loves people who have edge, and he sometimes puts people on edge deliberately, which is a perfectly healthy thing to do. When I was uh, preparing for Living in Harmony, the Western, he sent a message to me, which was dutifully handed to me, typed out and it said i am taking quick draw lessons from sammy davis jr and steve mcqueen period patrick but he wouldn't be able to fake that so when the day came and we were on the set of living in harmony the western village much money was wagered by the crew and the stuntmen quietly on the sides about who would be the fastest on the draw though we both fired we were so close that only one shot was heard and we all had to wait for the film to come back from the laboratory the next day to see actually how many little pictures it took for me to get my gun out and him to get his gun out you know there was nothing ever written down between patrick and lou it was all a handshake and fallout pound for pound even today is still probably the most expensive 54 minutes of television ever made that's saying a lot talking about love and attention you went on to work with Patrick in 1981. Was this reminiscent of The Prisoner? Kings and Desperate Men was reminiscent of The Prisoner for both me and Patrick because he was a prisoner again and I was the prison keeper. That is one reason, sir, that I am not afraid of you because I have been there before. This relationship of The Prisoner, and uh, which he was playing again, and me, it was difficult for him not to want to swing back into that other ex-secret agent rebellious state of mind. And occasionally he would say to me, come on, Alexis, no one's going to believe that I'm putting up with this stuff. The audience is going to expect me to whip out a credit card and just cut somebody's throat any second now. Number six is terrorized throughout the series by a large ominous balloon called Rover. 